for uh, <laughs> responding very directly to the, the panel's title in a request for uh, policy recommendations, and doing so very quickly and uh, very comprehensively. Strangely enough, I don't need to say that was the quotation conclusion I was going to have, so now I'm going to save a little time. <laughs> um, yes, Mr. Chairman, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm delighted to be back in Vienna to address you and wish to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to be the last speaker. As it is writ in sacred text, the first shall be last and the last first. In the World Conference on Human Rights uh, here in, Geneva, um, in Vienna, they adopted the Vienna Declaration and Program of Action, referred to as the DPA, which recognized and affirmed, and I quote, that all human rights derive from the dignity and worth inherent in the human person, and that human person is the central subject of human rights and fundamental freedoms, and consequently, should be the principal beneficiary and should participate actively in the realization of these rights and freedoms. Mm -hmm. Its Article 1 states, the World Conference on Human Rights reaffirms the solemn commitment of all states to fulfill their obligations to promote universal respect for and observance and protection of all human rights and fundamental freedoms for all in accordance <clears throat> with the Charter of the United Nations, other instruments related to human rights, the Bill of Human Rights, it means, and international law. <clears throat> the universal nature of these rights and freedoms is beyond question. In its penultimate paragraph, the DPA concludes with a follow-up to the World Conference on Human Rights and further recommends that the Commission on Human Rights, the Commission on Human Rights, annually review the, the progress towards this end. Yes, you heard me correctly, the Commission on Human Rights. In articles published in 1994 on slavery in Sudan, threats against Special Rapporteur Gaspar Biro since 1997, on blasphemy at the United Nations, universal human rights and human rights in Islam, and Islamism grows stronger at the United Nations, stealth jihad at the UN, and many others, we have illustrated how a systematic effort has been made at the United Nations by certain member states to replace some of the, of the dominant paradigms of international relations now referred to as complementary standards by the OIC and the UN diplomatically, its diplomatic language. Already in September 1992, six months before the Vienna Conference, the final declaration of the conference of the 108 non-aligned countries held at Jakarta, Indonesia, stressed differences in cultures, in quotes, and implied the differences in the interpretation of human rights should be recognized. This became, soon became, the cultural relativism ploy which we have warned against systematically since then. At the recent 13th session of the Human Rights Council in Geneva, I'm speaking of the 23rd of March, which is hardly three weeks ago, two weeks ago, speaking jointly for the Association for World Education and World Union for Progressive Judaism in the context of the Vienna DPA, we paid homage to Sergio Viero Di Mello, the then High Commissioner for Human Rights, who was tragically slaughtered with 20 other members of his staff in the Baghdad Canal Hotel bombing of 19th of August 2003 after the UN refused Allied military protection, putting their faith in the fact that they're coming from the UN. He was there as the Secretary General's Special Representative in Iraq. In his last report on the follow-up to the World Conference on Human Rights, he pertinently stated the hopeless mess into which the Commission had fallen. It was this report that led to an attempt to improve the structure and mechanism on human rights and finally to the creation of the Human Rights Council. We shall quote his courageous words then, seven years later, 
as we did at the Commission soon after his death and recently again, for they were a harbinger of the gathering stealth storm that resulted in a decision to replace the discredited Commission with what was intended to be a responsible body, the Human Rights Council. Quote, membership of the Commission on Human Rights, this is Viero di Melo, must carry responsibilities. I therefore wonder whether the time has not come for the Commission itself to develop a go code of guidelines for access to membership of the Commission and a code of conduct for members while they serve on the Commission. After all, the Commission on Human Rights has a duty to humanity and the members of the Commission must themselves set the example of adherence to the international human rights norms, in practice as well as in law. His conclusion then is still meaningful today when we consider the disastrous follow-ups follow to the Vienna Declaration and the two world conferences on racism uh, known as Durban I in 2001 and what is often called Durban II, which took place in Geneva last year, despite what is propagated worldwide by the Durban idolaters and the current catastrophe and the, and the current catastrophic Human Rights Council. Here are De Mello's words. Again, Without universal respect for human rights, the vision of the Charter of a world of peace grounded in respect for human rights and economic and social justice will remain an illusion. Let us vindicate the Charter's vision by being faithful to the universal implementation of human rights. In doing so, we shall continue in the direction of history rather than allowing ourselves to be diverted from the course we know to be just. A year later, in 2004, when introducing recommendations for a new Human Rights Council, Secretary General Kofi Annan declared that the Commission had been undermined by allowing participation of countries whose purpose was, quote, not to strengthen human rights but to protect themselves against criticism or to criticize others, end of quote. His chief of staff then, Mark Maloch Brown, uh, not Gordon, of course, put it more bluntly, quote, for the great global public, the performance or non-performance of the Human Rights Commission has become the litmus test of UN renewal, end of quote. Little has changed since. In reality, it is worse, except that the great expectations have been dissipated by a gloomy uh, despair and worse to come for those who do not have eyes to see or ears to hear. As a veteran NGO human rights defender since 1986 at the United Nations in Geneva, I have watched what is grandly called the international community at the Palais des Nations, which I sometimes call in remembrance of Ludwig II, the Palais Schwanstein, <laughs> descending incontinently, recklessly, the staircase which leads to a dark gulf. It is a fine broad staircase at the beginning, but after a bit the carpet ends, a little further on there are only flagstones, and a little further on still these break beneath your feet. This timeless description by Churchill of Britain's situation at a crucial moment on the 24th of March 1938 in the House of Commons during the, during the period of grotesque appeasement gives a vivid image of the general climate nowadays at the UN Human Rights Council. The problem is that everyone knows but no one wants to recognize the fact that the emperor strutting in his palace, in his palais de nation, announcing royally, l'état, uh, c'est moi, or rather, les droits de l'homme, c'est nous, is stark naked. Three months ago, we gave a longer presentation in the European Parliament in Brussels. That text contains much documentation, was available here for some background information, but unfortunately in a limited number of photostats due to lack of facilities. You may also be interested in a recent piece that was posted on Jihad Watch in regard to violence against women and our recent uh, comments 
on FGM, the Oido Mali, the origin of evil council event when we were again stopped. A classic example of the Game of Nations council where o OIC constantly tries to rule the roost, also available on Robert Spencer's Jihad Watch with the vivid, unbelievable UN video, Sharia Gate Shipwreck, as we called it, uh, would also give you an idea. 26 minutes, you won't believe when you see the Egyptian delegate waving my statement above his head, which he shouldn't have had, with a moustache looking like Adolf Hitler. It's the moustache favored, actually, uh, uh, in Egypt. There's association for moustaches, and Hitler's moustache has wow. first place. And he actually spoke about Islam will not be crucified in this council. And the crucifixion was if you link FGM in any way to Islam, whereas everyone knows that in Egypt, according to UNICEF figures, 96% of all girls every year are mutilated mm. because of the Shafia interpretation mm. of the, uh, the Shafia of Sharia law, and this of course is not allowed anymore, it cannot uh, be used, and when I was speaking at the same time uh, about the stoning of women in Iran and Sudan, and pointing out in Iran they are buried up to their waist in pits and blunt stones are used there by increasing their agony and death, and that the marriage age for girls remains at nine years old since the exam Islamic Republic, uh, the, resolution, uh, the revolution in 1979, reduced the age by half from 18, as it was with the Shah, uh, until uh, 9. Now what is amusing uh, is the crass, um, uh, the crassness uh, to which the usual suspects are willing to go at the council. Here are the words of the Iranian delegates speaking on a point of order, which was not a point of order, it was a response, and he was reprimanded very slightly by the Romanian president. Mr. Chairman, the statement and the references made by the speaker in the statement is false and has nothing to do with the realities of my country. I just wanted, for the record, he said, that the stoning of women for alleged uh, uh, adultery still occurs regularly in Iran, end of quote. It's not true. It is completely false and out of the question. Now, they have a penal legislation, Articles 10, I won't read them to you, 10, 100, 102, 104, which explain exactly how you stone them and that you mustn't have stones which are too blunt because they have to be in the maximum uh, of uh, pain. During this, uh, well I've spoken about that, in a statement made in Geneva in 2008 by the courageous Iranian Nobel Prize winner, Shiran Abadi, a girl in her native country is considered, this is her speaking, an adult and liable to punishment, even execution at nine and a boy at 15. She totally rejected cultural relativism. I'm speaking of the Nobel Prize laureate, Shirin uh, uh, Ebadi, who spoke also at Emory University on the 17th of October 2008, where she said very pertinently, I have always opposed the Islamic Declaration on Human Rights. Two months later, she spoke again at the UN, uh, where I asked her a question, which can be found again on Jihad Watch for those who are interested. Despite all this, last week, the UN elected Iran to its commission on the status of women, not to the council, which they wanted, with a four-year seat on the influential human rights body. This was a few days after Iran dropped its outrageous demand for a return to the Human Rights Council. It should be noted that the Special Status of Women Commission, according to its website, is, quote, dedicated exclusively to gender equality and advancement of women. Iran will be joined next year by the Democratic Republic of Congo and Zimbabwe. To give you an idea of how oh things function no, in Korea. the UN because they yeah, are in missing. a group of countries which North have Korea. the right, North America, South America, Europe, wherever, East, to have their place uh, in the Palais Schwanstein, if I may uh, put it like that. To, up you, to update you on the latest situation, Ten weeks ago, OIC Secretary General El, uh, El uh, Ek Meledin Izanoglu delivered a statement at what is called the high segment uh, beginning of the 13th session. I prefer to use the word uh, highfalutin. We have ministers coming and it lasts a whole week. He concluded on what 
he called a happy note. Again, I won't read you um, the whole thing. It's again in, the, uh, in Jihad Watch. I will just con conclude the revealing passages which we hear all the time at the UN, which even Mary Robinson, with her Palestinian Muslim advisor, used in 2002, which I reproduced, which is unbelievable. Here is what Izanaglu said. Uh, we take pride that Islam was the first religion that called for full equality among people regardless of their race, language, ethnic origin, social status, etc. This equality has been associated with preserving human dignity, a concept that goes far beyond that of human rights. The establishment of the commission will introduce, the commission being their new, I didn't read that, their new commission, Islamic Commission on Human Rights, which the High Commissioner on Human Rights was obliged, more or less, I hope she didn't believe it, to say it was a big advance. The establishment of the Commission on Human Rights in Islam will introduce a paradigm shift within the OIC in the way universal human rights and freedoms flow together with Islamic values to offer, maybe as Michael Horowitz would have put it, to offer a coherent and strong system aimed at facilitating the full enjoyment of all human rights of the member states. A very strange affirmation. He thereby confirmed that the 1990 Cairo Declaration of Human Rights in Islam continues to be hailed steadfastly by the OIC as having primacy for its 57 member states over the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I would remind you that Articles 24 and 25 of that 90 uh, 1990 Cairo Declaration state clearly that all the articles which look like the Universal Declaration but they're not are dependent on Sharia law and Sharia law men and women who if they're Muslim have no equality and uh, infidels have no equality of course with Muslims. Mm -hmm. Nothing could be clearer than this solemn announcement by the OIC Secretary General but then came a worst clangor. On the 19th of April only three weeks ago when a meeting took place at the OIC headquarters in in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, between the OIC Secretary General and High Commissioner for Human Rights, Nevertalem Pillay, who was on a, on a general visit. This was clearly a follow-up to Islam Blue's statement of the UN Human Rights Council. We learn on the OIC website, the High Commissioner congratulated the, Je the, the Secretary General on the prospective establishment of the Commission and assured full support of her office in its formative phase. There's, I'm afraid, nothing else she could have done. The OIC website refers to the Independent Permanent Commission on Human Rights, by which I strongly advise you to read. There is, of course, uh, no time uh, for me to do that here. Uh, this and other attempts at stealth jihad to muzzle freedom of expression at the UN, uh, at the UN Human Rights Council is being effectively challenged by Western countries and NGOs and is also possible that the influence of cyber state, space conveying such news worldwide is having a beneficial effect. What we were able to say in our ten statements, two minutes each only, last month at the Human Rights Council without being stopped and in the absence of Egypt's moustached comic troublemaker is indicative. The blatant Judeophobia anti-Semitism in the Arab Muslim world is exemplified by the two Isesco books, I left documentation on the back, we discovered on display on the 60th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and described our public complaint documentation a year ago, 12th of January 2009. What is most disturbing is that Isesco, the scholarly wing of the OIC countries, have an educational partnership with UNESCO since 1981, yet this changes nothing. The documents on all this were also available here. What is our policy recommendation? And I will conclude. That's good, thanks. It is to oppose every attempt by Islamists or their allies to introduce Islamic values into our society. Those Sharia linked values are today alien to our Judeo Christian Enlightenment values on which our modern democracies, societies have been built. We must oppose attempts to create parallel systems of justice. We must fight every step of the way, all attempts to create Sharia courts. All of us, Christians, Jews, Hindus, humanists, and especially Muslims, must re reject Sharia law because as the Islamic scholar Hassan Mahmoud has clearly stated, and as we can see, Muslims are the first victims of Islamic law. I usually, uh, well, I will conclude by saying, 
It's now 65 years since the horrors of the Second World War and the founding of the United Nations, a body often more divided regionally, politically, and spiritually than united. The principal aim of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights was to create a framework for a world society in need of universal codes based on mutual consent in order to function. We must always remain vigilant to prevent these international standards being contested by those who call into question at the United Nations or elsewhere the universality of these human rights principles. This creeping dimitri at the UN and elsewhere, led by the OIC and its agents and allies, should be denounced for what it is a return to the media um, of the medieval past. In my presentation at the European Parliament Conference in 2007 and 2010, I ended, and I would like to do with Sir Charles Popper, you've used the part of the quote, I usually use the whole thing, in his analysis of Plato's criticism of democracy. So Karl Popper refers to a paradox of freedom and a paradox of tolerance. Here today, once again, I would like to repeat the whole words from his work. Unlimited tolerance must lead to the disappearance of tolerance. If we extend unlimited tolerance, even to those who are intolerant, if we are not prepared to defend a tolerant society against the onslaught of the intolerant, then the tolerant will be destroyed and tolerance with them. We should therefore claim in the name of tolerance the right not to tolerate the intolerant. We should claim that any movement preaching intolerance places itself outside the law, and we should consider incitement to intolerance and persecution as criminal in the same way as we should consider incitement to murder or to kidnapping or to the revival of the slave trade as it is in Sudan today. Thank you. Thank all of our panelists. Uh, we are over time.